Hi everyone, this is John Kenyon. I'm very excited to be doing this class with you all. In the last 10 years or so, I've been focusing on applying NVC to mediating conflict and to, uh, to think of mediation as uh, not just helping other people have a conversation, but also how to mediate the conversations within our own heads and also between ourselves and others. So how to mediate all aspects of conflict, really. Um, I've gotten to know Matthew over the past number of years. He's been um, involved in that work with me, and he's also been very involved with work related to integral theory, and well, Matthew will talk about that, but and lots of around education, Montessori work, and I really value highly what Matthew brings to this kind of learning, and I'm very excited to be doing this together with you, Matthew, and what we'll be offering in this class. Matthew, do you want to say anything to the group? I'm extremely excited to be here with all of you. Um, John and I have been talking about doing a course like this for for quite some time and it's really great to have a a group who wants to play with us and explore this topic a little bit more deeply. As John said, I've been assisting John and working together with John for for a while and we became really interested in how we could look at using NVC as well as some other approaches to exploring the topic of worldview and how worldview can sometimes play an important role in, in why people find it difficult to understand each other. So in this course, we're going to be exploring a couple of different approaches to interrogating that topic in a way that can really inform our NVC practice and help our NVC practice to be even more effective when worldviews do conflict. So that's all that I would like to say by, by way of introduction. And I want to say one more thing, Matthew. Matthew's from South Africa and is living in Holland right now. So I just love this very uh, kind of international feel to, to doing this together as well, Matthew. With that, I think, Matthew, if you want to take it from there. I would enjoy hearing from each person what they're hoping to get out of being here. I have moved away from my family's basic worldview, which makes communication slightly difficult. So I'm hoping that it will help me to communicate particularly with my parents better. Thank you. I was really intrigued by the name of the course. I really grew up learning that, like, my family's worldview is absolutely right and other people suck, and that makes interacting with other people really difficult, as you can maybe mm -hmm. imagine. That's something that I started to get out of for, I don't know, the last, like, four or five years or so. But, you know, I learned that very strongly, and so I'm really interested in learning something else and how you really actually can somehow connect with people who have different worldviews. Wonderful. Thank you. The reason I'm here is because I always know what I'm thinking, but I rarely know or am aware of what I'm feeling, which of course dictates, I run up that ladder of inference, and what I'm feeling dictates what I'm thinking. So I want to get back to that. And my role, as I see it in the future, is to help businesses understand how to incorporate environmental and social sustainability practices into their businesses. And I'm guessing that nonviolent communication skills are going to be very important in that role. Thank you very much. I've been immersed in NBC for a while, immersed in a couple of the mediation programs. And uh, I'm also been a student of integral and spiral dynamics for many years. And the work that I do is within organizations and leadership development and organizational development using integral. What I'd like from the class is just more learning, more connecting, enhancing my own skills and capacity, and maybe contributing something along the way. Thanks. So it's a really diverse group of people, diverse in terms of their experience with nonviolent communication and their experience with, with work and with life. What I would like us to look at today is four key perspectives through which we're, we're able to look at the world and four key perspectives which I believe can fundamentally inform uh, our worldview based on which perspective we tend to focus on. I would like us to get a real embodied sense of what these different perspectives are. And what makes it really interesting is that these are four perspectives 
of you. These are four fundamental dimensions of you right in this moment. And they're present in your awareness right now. What I would like to start with is just by having a real experience of that. And I'd like to invite you to be comfortable. If you're sitting, make sure you're sitting in a comfortable way. You might want to close your eyes. And I would like you to become aware of your breath. Breathe in and breathe out. And I would like you to bring your awareness onto what you're feeling or thinking in this moment. What feelings do you have? What thoughts do you have? What motivations do you have? And this is the first perspective that I would like us to engage. I'm going to refer to it as we go on as the upper left, and we'll talk about that a little more. But for right now, I would just like you to feel into what are your feelings, what are your thoughts. And then I would like you to shift your awareness on to the reason that we're all here together. So think about what connects our hearts. Think about all of the people whose voices you've just heard. All of us have come together on this call. Move from your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own motivations, and try and extend to include all of us who are on this call and think about what has drawn us together as a community for this time. Let's try and focus on that. And that's the second dimension of yourself that I would like for us to engage. And I'm going to speak about that as the lower left. And then as you're ready, I'd like you to open your eyes. If they're closed, start looking around. Become aware of the space that you're in the colors, the shape, maybe some sounds that you can hear outside, maybe some smells that are in the air. Become aware of the way that your body feels. Is there some part of your body which feels uncomfortable? Aware of the feeling of your clothes on your skin. All of these physical objective phenomena which are around us. That's the third dimension that I would like us to look at. I'm going to talk about that as the upper right. And then I would like you, taking all of these things into account, to become aware of the way that the world is not just made up of a collection of random objects, but that these things are connected in a system, or in many systems, that they relate to each other. If there's a light in your room where you're sitting right now, think about how that light, that light bulb, is connected to this enormous system, electricity system, grid which runs throughout a large geographical area with enormous complexity. Right now we're on a conference call. There's this fantastically complex system that runs through the internet and runs through these telephone lines that enables us to be here together hearing each other's voices and connecting in this way even though we're thousands of kilometers apart from each other. And this collective systemic perspective is the fourth dimension that I'd like for us to engage. These four perspectives arise from two fundamental distinctions. And the first distinction that we have here is between the first two that we looked at, things that we can't see, that we can't measure, that we can't touch. The first one, if you remember, was our feelings, our thoughts, the inside of us, our interior experience of the world. And the second one 
was looking at the inside of our culture, of our community, of our connection, of the way that we are together. And these are the interior dimensions of who we are. And they can't be seen or measured. And then on the other side, we have these objective dimensions which we can see and measure. And the first one was looking at all of these sensory experiences, these things that we can touch and feel around us. And then we looked into the way that all of these are connected. And so that's the one set of distinctions between interior and exterior views of reality. And the second distinction is this distinction between individual, between the inside of us as an individual and as these individual exterior phenomena, and the collective, the way that we relate objectively to outside things and the way that they relate to each other as a system and the way that the interior of our collectiveness and our culture. From this we can look at four distinct quadrants. One which deals with the interior of the individual, one which is a subjective perspective and in the quadrants which we have that is in the upper left and then in the lower left the uh, intersubjective space, the interior of our collective experience. So those are the interior perspectives, individual and collective. And then on the exterior side, we have the behavioral, the objective, the exterior of the individual. And in the lower right, we have the interobjective, the collective exterior, this systemic perspective. And so these are four lenses through which we can we can look at almost anything at any occasion and you just did this in your own awareness looking at yourself in this moment you were able to view your own experience through all four of these different lenses so that's the first use that we have of this and the second is that these are four aspects that are arising in every occasion in every moment so in your experience right now, all four of these perspectives exist and they all arise together. But the reality is that most of the time we are not focusing on all of them at the same time. We focus on different perspectives in different moments. So sometimes we are focusing on our relationship to the exterior world and sometimes we are focusing on our interior experience. And that means that in almost every moment, our perspective is very true, but very partial. That it only takes into account one part of what's arising. I would like us to try looking at this with another example, so that we are able to get some more insight. And I would like to look at the issue of childhood. What does it mean to be a child? What is childhood? I would love it if you have a perspective on what childhood is, if you could say it. What does it mean to be a child? What is childhood? Freedom, fun, less restrictive. Okay. Freedom, fun, less Curiosity. restrictions. These are some of the characteristics which you see children as having. Yes. Okay. You would see childhood as? The time when children basically learn the conditioning of their parents but they're too young to really understand that they're learning it or to fully understand what it is. So they learn it, and even as a kid, they can have some sense of what serves them and what doesn't. And then when they get older, they have to kind of reckon with this conditioning and see if they can alter it, which is difficult and slow. So if I may be a little pessimistic, to me childhood is this time where you're a little bit stuck and you just get the conditioning and you don't have the resources to do much with it. Okay. Childhood is the time when we learn or absorb the conditioning of our culture, of the world around us. Yeah, I was referring most to the parents, but certainly cultural and everything also. Okay, so primarily from parents. Okay, what else? We're not liable for full judicial punishment if we are naughty. <laughs> and we also don't have the day to vote or drink and drive. Okay, what else is childhood about? Physical development and immature physical development. The time before our bodies are mature. It's about learning language. It's about learning 
who my parents are, my siblings, my friends, where everybody fits in my little system and changing the system along the way. Learning who I am, learning language. And oftentimes learning religion, religious practices, values. Cultural values. The part of our life that foundationally informs the rest of our life. Part of our life that foundationally informs the rest of our life. Okay. So I'd like to stop there and just reflect on this. I'm going to read out some of the perspectives that we have here. So we have this part of our life that foundationally informs the rest of our life. We have a time where we experience freedom, fun, less restrictions. It's a time when we learn or absorb the conditioning of our culture and the world around us, specifically from our parents. It's a period in which we legally do not have to take responsibility and the limitations placed upon our capacity from a legal perspective. It's the time before our bodies are fully mature. It's a time when we acquire language and learn who we are and where we learn the cultural values around us. And I'd like to reflect on how many just in this short time with a small group of people who it's easy to imagine probably have a great deal of similarity in many parts of their lives and in many parts of their worldview. Even in this group, in these few minutes, how many different perspectives, how many different versions we could get around one simple concept, like childhood. Quite fascinating. What's also fascinating is that when we look at these different perspectives, it becomes clear that all of them have an element of truth in them. At least for me, I look at all of them and they're none of them which I say, well, that's just not true. All of these perspectives reflect an element of truth, but they don't reflect the whole truth. And each of them are looking at the same issue from a very different perspective. And so, Let's sort these views a little bit into those four quadrants. In the upper left quadrant, and remember that's dealing with the interior, the inside experience of the individual, we can look at childhood as a particular state, as a particular experience. What's the experience of childhood like? It's fun, it's free, it's less restrictions. Or we can look at it as a sort of developmental level. It's a time when we acquire language, it's a time when we have an egocentric view of the world. All of these sort of classic developmental understandings of what childhood are, look at the interior experience of the individual child. And then when we go down to the lower left, and remember that's the inside of the collective, we have all of these cultural constructions of what childhood is, which differ enormously from one place to the next, that are bound by the common beliefs, the common values which a particular culture holds. So I've worked with children in a number of different countries and the understanding culturally of what childhood is in China is very, very different from the understanding of what childhood is in South Africa. For instance, in South Africa, there's a prevalent sort of value for children to learn from their mistakes, that falling down and scratching your knee is not necessarily a bad thing. And children should get out in the world and they should climb trees and they should get the mud between their toes and do all of these things which they're not going to be able to do as easily when they're older. And in China, there's a very different perception of childhood, and that is that children are very precious and they should be protected so that they don't hurt themselves. And so if a child falls, there's a, there's a big fuss that's made over them. And so the different values in those cultures inform very different practices. And let's move to the upper right. And remember, that looks at the exterior of an individual. And so from that perspective, we see childhood as being something biological. What is the organism developing at that point? what happens to a child's body, or we have a very behavioristic understanding of what childhood is. Childhood is dictated by the actions which an individual is able to take. And when we look at the lower right perspective, we have a social systems 
type of definition of what childhood is. So, for example, a legal definition of what childhood is would fall very much into this quadrant, into this perspective. So I hope that this example helps to clarify a little bit how each of these four different perspectives show up and also that they're able to reflect a very different and very true perspective of the same occasion, of the same issue, of the same idea. So when we look at childhood in this instance, there are four, at least four, very different perspectives and all of them are true but partial. And when we look through one of these lenses and somebody else looks through another lens, we have a very different view of what childhood is, which makes it easy sometimes for us to come into conflict. When one person says that childhood is a legal definition and another person says that childhood is a developmental state, there's an apparent conflict. And actually, they're looking at the same issue from different perspectives, from different vantage points. So what I would like for us to do is a little bit of practice. We're going to break up into, into groups of two people. And I would like you to do something similar to what we've just done in the larger group, where I would like one of you to look at a decision that you're trying to make in your life right now, a decision which is up in front of you. It can be a relatively small decision. It doesn't have to be anything major. And I would like you to try and look at this decision through each of these four perspectives together with your partner and try and map out how this decision affects you in terms of your interior individual experience. How does it feel for you as an individual? Then look at it from a behavioral perspective, from this exterior of the individual. And then look at it in terms of how it affects your relationships and how it affects your culture, and look at it from a systemic perspective. So how does it affect the economic system in which you are, the family system, the whatever social system it might be relevant to? Matthew, I have a suggestion to make it even easier for people to remember those four quadrants. Just walk through real quick the visual of it, just to have them draw if they have a piece of paper in front of them, that four-quadrant grid with the dimensions of interior, yeah. exterior, individual, and collective, just so they have that as a visual to help them walk through it. I think that's a great idea. The perspective that I brought up where a kid is conditioned by the parents, and then when they grow up, they have all these ideas that are kind of in them from from the parents. I'm kind of wondering what category that would be. I have an idea around what perspective that could be, but I think this is a great opportunity to also hear from other people. So if anybody has has an idea around which quadrant that might fit into. It would be lower left, the cultural, lower right as well, because there are social aspects. Certainly it's the collective end of things. Yeah, I would say both of those are accurate. I would say the most obvious place to put it would be also in, in the lower left in terms of the cultural understanding, but even looking at that issue that you brought up, we could look at it through multiple quadrants. And so, in a way, it would also be an upper left issue because it's, it has a developmental aspect to it in that terms of children having a developmental sensitivity for the acquisition of culture. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. All right. If we can move into the breakouts now then. Welcome back, everybody. What I would love to do is I would love to hear from at least one person from each group if you could share what your decision was and just point out those four quadrants. Would anybody like to share around what their experience was, uh, how it was for them to do this exercise? I find it a bit confusing because often I can see how things fit into multiple quadrants. And so it feels like it's fuzzy and hard to do. In other words, hard to tease out the threads that put it in one versus another. It's not easy to just classify things neatly into one category. Sometimes it seems to be, and at other times it doesn't seem to be. And at the same time, sometimes it's hard to understand how it may be clear how it is in three of the quadrants, but in one of the quadrants it's not as clear. Okay, so it's not always easy to be able to 
to access all four of these lenses. Sometimes one of them, seem, well, some of them seem more obvious than others. Yep. Thank you. Great. I found it was fun because I had just about an hour before we started the call come to a decision about which of two different diets I was going to follow. It was amazing going through the quadrants. I hadn't done a quadrivial analysis of it before. And doing it this way suddenly made it so obvious what my choice should have been and I could probably have come to the same conclusion much sooner if I'd used the quadrants in the first place. Would you be willing to share those four quadrants with the larger group? Choosing between a, a, a paleo diet and a mostly raw, the wild diet, I'm just looking at the two of them. And on the upper left, the one is mostly raw and vegetarian, which I'm very unfamiliar with. And that makes me feel uncomfortable and uncertain and as if I'm in a strange place. And it makes it quite difficult. The, the, the um, paleo uses a lot more cooked foods and preparation methods that I'm familiar with. And that makes me feel comfortable with it. So that would be my upper left. Upper right, I know myself not to be good at pushing through with discipline. So the chances of me pushing through on the raw and vegetarian side is not great because it's going to intimidate me. And the other one being more familiar, I'm much more likely to just get on with it. So that's upper right, low left. Um, in my family, I'm much more likely to get buy-in and an improvement in the, in the whole family's eating habits if I go for more cooked food than raw food and more need some spin vegetarian because I'm going to get into trouble if I try that. So that would be my lower left. And then the lower right, I looked at things like I would have to drive further if I was going the vegetarian because I would look for a lot more organic produce, which would cost me more and put more emissions into the, into the environment and so on. On the other hand, obviously, eating more meat is less environmentally friendly and the bigger eco picture. So therefore, that would not be such a good thing. So that would be my lower right. Thank you. That's great. Is there anybody else, maybe from the other group, who would like to share about how this experience was for them, doing this exercise? Actually, saying it all out loud with somebody else really supported me in, in getting clarity about a, a decision that, in coming to a decision, feeling some sadness about what the loss will be, but by really recognizing the upper right quadrant was needing attention, really helped me land on it's okay to let go and to leave this organization and bless them and just for my own care. And just saying it out loud just gave me a sense of my own self-care and where my attention needs to be in making the decision to let this organization go that I've been working with. Thank you. That's great. So I would like to make a, a, a couple of, of comments. And the first thing that I would like to point out is for those of us who practice NVC, we know how difficult it often is for people when they begin NVC to connect with their interior experience, to connect with what their feelings are. And in fact, many people in the culture that most of us are raised in lack even vocabulary to express their feelings. And a big part of this is due to the fact that a lot of our upbringing at this time and for some time has been focused very much on the right side of these quadrants and that we're educated progressively away from our interior perspectives and focused increasingly on the exterior world. And if you think about our education system, for instance, and the focus on science and on measurement and on observable facts, that becomes very apparent. And so many people fundamentally lack the skills that would enable them to connect more meaningfully with the interior part of their reality. And, and NVC is one practice which we can engage, which can help us to get more insight into what our own interior experience is, to connect empathically with what the interior experience of another person is, and to get some insight into this we field, into this cultural field that exists in relationship. And that, for me, is, is one of the the greatest values of NVC. But what's also important to realize is because people often lack skills to be able to connect with that part of themselves, they lack the ability to be able to access that lens, doesn't mean that that part of them ceases to exist. And so many people, although of course the interior of their individual is arising in every moment, just like all of the other perspectives are, they find it very difficult to connect with it and they're able to connect with the exterior 
but find it very difficult to connect with what's going on inside of them and what's going on between them and other people. And in this way, NVC is able, through the use of an observation, to help to connect what goes on in an observable, measurable, external way and see how that can act as the stimulus of an internal experience. Understanding these four perspectives is also very valuable in that when we choose strategies to meet our needs in the world, they tend to be a strategy which engages primarily one of these perspectives. And so often when people come into conflict, it's because they're engaging the same topic, as we've said, from a very different viewing the same issue, the same incident, the same occasion, from very, very different perspectives. And that will inform very, very different strategies. And so from having this more global perspective, that can sometimes help us to see the ways in which people are viewing things in very different ways in service of helping us find ways that people are able to meet their needs. And that different needs often come up more frequently from these different perspectives. So some needs focus very much on our interconnectedness, on connection, on community, on sharing, on collaboration. And some needs focus more on our own interior experience, on spiritual communion, on growth. And some needs focus more on our exterior world, on food, on water, on movement. And at the same time, all of these needs can arise in all of these quadrants. And that another way in which I think having this more integrated perspective can help us have more facility and more insight in connecting empathically with people. John, I'd like to see if you're there. Yes, I am. Can I do a, a quick review of what I heard you saying? The harvesting as it applied to the NBC components, mm -hmm. observations, feelings, needs, requests, and that depending on those four different quadrants, how those map onto what we can observe in the exterior world and how we relate to the different needs and the different needs kind of point to different quadrants to some degree. Did I get the essence of it? I think so, yeah. Okay. So Matthew's been presenting about these four quadrants, and there happens to be four elements of empathy that we focus on, and it came out of, in terms of dealing with a conflict, either me listening to somebody talking about a conflict they have with somebody else, or if I'm in conflict with somebody and how I empathize with that, what are the aspects of empathy, how to practice empathy in a way that, that really helps, especially under those kind of circumstances or conditions. We've come up with four of those, and those don't necessarily map onto the four quadrants. I see them as four different dimensions of empathy. So in a similar way, I think it's analogous, but they don't map onto, the, in my current understanding, those same quadrants that Matthew's just been talking about. So I'll tell you about those four, four elements. The idea being what we're looking at in this class is if we have an understanding that people who are in conflict, one way to look at the conflict could be as they're looking at the situation from different perspectives, different quadrants, and aren't aware that they could be mutually compatible, and instead they're sort of focused on those perspectives in a way that's creating some conflict of who's right, who's wrong, who has the truth, who doesn't. So what we want to do is actually where this is going to lead for today's class is to have you practice empathizing with somebody, with your partner, which would be analogous to out in the world if you're listening to somebody and they're telling you about somebody that they're in conflict with and you want to be supportive to them. You want to be able to connect with them and sort of enjoy connecting to what this person is telling you and, and hopefully in a way that's supportive to them how to do that using what we're talking about on this call. As well as when I do mediation out in the world, I'm in the role of a mediator helping other people. I do what's called pre-mediation, which basically is where I prepare people to be in the mediation process. That I'll be there during the mediation to facilitate people having a difficult conversation. And I find it really useful to talk with people ahead of time to prepare them for that conversation. And one of the ways I prepare them is, is for them to get empathy. And I listen to them. But there's a particular way to listen and give empathy, I think, that is particularly helpful. And having this, this idea, or this framework of different quadrants that people might be looking at the world from could even add to that, whether I'm in pre-mediation or I'm just talking to somebody. I'll tell you about the four elements of empathy that we've come up with. 
then give you a chance to try it out. The four elements are, number one, presence. Number two, silent empathy. Number three, understanding or meaning. And number four, need language, deepening into needs. So presence, the way I define presence is to try to make it doable. You know, what does that really mean to be present when we're empathically listening to another? Presence. What is presence? How do you do presence? For me, doing presence is letting go of thought. It's shifting away from focusing on my thinking about what the person in front of me is saying to just being with them with my attention, letting go of thinking about what they're saying and instead, for example, focusing on the tone of the voice, the spaces between the words, perceiving body language, but without labeling it, just being present to body language. And in these ways, I'm not engaging my thinking mind around what somebody's saying. I'm trying to just be the, the focusing of attention, my awareness, place, you know, gently resting my awareness, my attention on somebody as they're speaking. And silent empathy, the contrast for that, both presence for me, presence and silent empathy are, are silent. It's not speaking out loud to somebody and saying back what we're hearing. But the silent empathy for me is the distinction there is I am thinking. I'm thinking to myself about what this person is saying. I'm asking myself, what's, what's important to this person? What's really going on for them? And guessing silently, are they wonder what they're, what, what are they reacting to? You know, what's their observation? What are they feeling? What are their needs? What are they wanting to meet their needs? So asking myself those questions, trying to listen for those things and what people are saying and guessing at those things as somebody's talking. So listening just to understand, listening to get to the needs and what people are saying, but doing all that silently. So that for me very much is about engaging my thinking mind, but in a very kind of conscious, focused way. It's it's not just my mind kind of wandering, but rather I'm, you know, directing my mind to try to focus on what's really going on for this person. And again, whereas presence for me is I'm not, I'm not trying to think. I'm trying to let go of thinking and just be in pure, as much as I can, pure awareness, pure attention. Like in meditation, when we're, we're focusing our attention on the breath, for example, watching the thoughts go by in our mind. It's that kind of attentiveness, mindfulness, and in this case, listening to another. Okay, so that's presence versus silent empathy. And then understanding and need language is the times when we want to say out loud back what we're hearing somebody say to kind of confirm our understanding and for the person to, to trust that they're being heard. And there's two ways that I see that we can do that. One is the understanding. What I call understanding is just that my intention is to reflect back what I'm hearing and not try to put it into feeling the needs to just just get it, just get the, the essence of what somebody's trying to say in very natural language. So that's something I think we all know how to do. We don't have to learn how to do that. It's more learning how to maintain our focus on that person. But I think we know how to say what we're hearing, you know, to paraphrase it, to pick up some of their key words. That's something I think that we don't need extra training for, really. We just need to kind of have that clarity of what we're doing, and then we just let someone know what we heard. So that's, I call that understanding, and it can be a lot easier on the listener to do that instead of trying to do too much with what somebody's saying. And sometimes it can be often a lot easier for the person receiving the empathy to hear it first as something that's in more natural language. And the need language is the observation, feelings, needs, requests, those four elements, and particularly focusing everything around needs and deepening into the needs. And when I reflect back what I'm hearing there to have that be the intention that I'm looking for the needs in what somebody is saying. And then I'm trying to link up what somebody's thinking and feeling to their needs and what people want to connect that to their needs. So as I reflect back what I'm hearing, that's my intention. Zero in on and use the language of needs to get back what I'm hearing somebody say. So those are four dimensions, four dimensions of empathy. And in, in each moment, I can be choosing which one to to do is I'm listening to somebody. So to give you a little a little taste of what I mean by by each one, I'll just start talking about something and I want you to practice presence for a moment with me while I'm talking to give you a sense of what I what I mean by it. 
So I'm going to be talking, and I want you to try to see if you can let go of trying to focus on the meaning of what I'm saying, understanding even what I'm saying, thinking about what I'm saying. See if you can just let all that go and just, just focus on the tone of my voice, the pauses in my speaking, and just trying to be with me with your full attention. So see if you can do that right now even as I'm going to continue talking. See if, if you can let go of your thinking about what I'm saying and perceiving like the sensations of the sound coming into your ears. So I'm sitting here at this airport. I'm very aware of the background noise and worried that that is distracting to you all and irritating to you all. It's getting irritating to me. (laughs) Uh, And so I'm feeling kind of frustrated about that. But I am glad that I've gotten myself situated and I can focus on talking to you all and sharing with you all this way of looking at empathy that's very meaningful to me. It's been really, really helpful to me and useful. So I'll stop there. I want to actually check out your experience and see if you were able to just even even for a moment, were you able to experience that difference between thinking about what I was saying and then just being with me with your attention, your awareness, and letting go of, of trying to think about what I was saying. Could I hear from a few people how that was for you to try to do that? I noticed when I was thinking about it, especially when I have done empathy other times, I really worry about missing the content and then the tension gets in the way a little bit. And so when I just kind of relaxed into it, it was actually easy to hear all the content without worrying because it was just kind of all happening and I was able to be receptive to it. So it was much nicer and easier that way. So it was more relaxing to you, actually. You could sort of just relax, and uh, it felt, felt kind of nice in that sense. There was some worry about, oh, am I going to miss something? But then if that was okay <laughs> for this exercise, then it felt kind of nice to just relax into being just being present without having to worry about even tracking content. Yeah, and I find that when I relax into presence, the content is just there, it's, and I don't lose it. So you actually found that even though you weren't trying to get content, it was just kind of there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's my experience too, actually. So I'm glad you put words to it. Thank you. Anybody else want to say how it was for you to try to do this, what I'm calling presence? Was anybody not able to do it? It didn't make sense to you. You didn't even know what the hell I'm talking about. Raise your hand if you want to speak to that. It's kind of frustrating for you because it didn't really make sense. Yeah, I'll speak to that. It makes perfect sense to me, and I know that I am able to do it on occasion at times. I did find myself distracted a little, and I did find my mind going to... Thoughts were coming into my mind. I don't really know what to do with those thoughts when they come into my mind, but they did. The thoughts were coming in, and I was saying... I think I was present in that I was saying, she it sounds like he's really uncomfortable with, with what's going on and, you know, would maybe even a little embarrassed and would really like this not to be happening, those thoughts were popping in my head, and I didn't want them to be popping in. I just wanted to not think, but I was thinking. Yeah. Well, I I find that those thoughts do come in, but for me, the choice is to I kind of run with that and kind of pursue that with my own thinking, you know, kind of flesh that out with my thinking, or do I just kind of notice that I had that thought, let it go, and and then go back to just being open and in my mind, just kind of clearing my mind and trying to just be there with my attention. That moment where you had of noticing the thought, and then it sounds like you kind of let it go and you went back to just being present. Is that true? Yeah, but I think I was working. That's the part that bothered me. I, I, I don't think it was as natural as I would have liked, and it can be sometimes. So, you know, for whatever reason, in this particular instance, I don't know if it was the distraction of the noise in and of itself or being in, on a call that, that is not a natural call for me. I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think I did begin to become more present, but it wasn't as, as natural as I would have liked. Right. Okay. But it sounds like the distinction made sense. That's the most important thing for me right now is if just that, that distinction is meaningful. And then, mm-hmm. of course, it's whether or not that's going to be useful for you. So that's a whole other question. Is it useful to, to do this as part of how you would listen to somebody? 
I find it very useful to be able to do both this presence and si- what I'm ca- calling silent empathy, which you, I think you gave a great example of for me. Cause having that thought, oh, I, it sounds like he might be feeling uncomfortable right now and would kind of maybe wish this wasn't going on and maybe he's even a little embarrassed. And that to me is silent empathy. You're silently trying to understand and connect with what's going on for me. So doing that versus just letting that go and being being with your awareness. So those are those two. So thank you both for, for your comments on that. And I just want to say a little bit more then about understanding and need language and then applying this to what we've what we were talking about earlier in the class. I think what's also important to realize is that these steps are, are not necessarily completely sequential. You don't have to do presence, then silent empathy, then you know, there's a degree of, of dancing and moving backwards and forwards between them as new things come up and that we may move into sound empathy or into needs language and then find that we need to return to presence. So it's quite a dynamic process. Thank you, Matthew. Exactly. That these are presented in a sequential order and there there's, there often is a, a certain kind of logical sequencing that can happen, but very much nonlinear as well. And it's just moment to moment, which of the four do I want to choose? So, yeah, thank you. Now, in terms of understanding and need language, to me, this is this has been super helpful. And if I'm listening to somebody, if I'm in conflict with them or I'm helping them in some form, they're in conflict with somebody else. To have this distinction of understanding versus the need language. An example might be, well, just even taking just as a really simple example in terms of what I said earlier about being at this airport and I'm uh, – yeah, you know, there's all this background noise and are people on the line going to be irritated by it and I'm feeling kind of irritated by it. And then if one of you was going to empathize with me out loud, so Carol was doing it silently, having some some thoughts about what to connect with my experience, if it was going to be out loud, what I would call understanding could sound something like, yeah, kind of like what Carol said, but saying it out loud. So, John, are you kind of uncomfortable and sort of irritated about the noise and, you know, kind of worried about how people's experiences on the call, something like that. So notice that I'm not trying to put it into classical feelings or needs or anything. It's just saying back what might be going on for me. And the contrast to that would be that this focus on really connecting things up to the needs. So it could sound like, so John, it, in the discomfort you're feeling, is that about really wanting, is that having about care for the for the people on the line and wanting them to have a really good experience and to contribute to, to their ease and of, of learning. And then I might go, well, yeah, actually, yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> it's coming out of care for people's consideration and care for the quality of the learning experience. Yeah. So notice then that's a whole different kind of focus. It's just really trying to go for the needs and connect my feelings to my needs and my thoughts to my needs. So now how about let's let's apply it to when worldviews conflict. And as a quick little exercise, the exercise is to be listening to somebody who's talking about a conflict they have with somebody else, some frustration with somebody else, and to see if we can be using these elements of, of empathy and maybe just sort of noticing which, you know, in each moment are you doing. If you're being silent, are you just kind of being present and letting go of your of thinking or or maybe are you thinking about what the person is saying? And then if you choose to say something back out loud to, to reflect back the experience of the other person, are you going to do the understanding, which is just sort of natural getting the gist of what they're saying, or are you going for needs and focusing on you know, connecting thoughts and feelings and what people want to the needs and kind of deepening into those needs? So seeing if you can pay attention to those four elements while you know you're listening to somebody and listening for is your partner who's talking in terms of those four quadrants upper right lower right upper left lower left it's like oh what quadrant is this person speaking from if they're talking about a conflict they're having with somebody oh i wonder what yeah what 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 what's the what's the quadrant that's they're most focused on and then, oh, I wonder what the quadrant of the other person is. If if I can get a sense of what they're frustrated about the other person, what quadrant that other person might be more focused on. So sort of listening for that those quadrants in my empathy for that person. So maybe, Matthew, would you demo with me a little bit and start talking about 
a conflict, a frustration with somebody, and I will attempt to demonstrate. So, um, yeah, I was so annoyed the other day, John. I was talking with this woman, and she was trying to convince me that that it's a good idea to reintroduce corporal punishment in schools. That's something that I have I have quite strong feelings about, and and I just couldn't connect with what she was saying. You know, I, I I was just getting so pissed off because she was just going on and on about how important she thinks it is that we hurt children. That's what I was hearing. So how important yeah. it is that what? Say that part again. I was hearing her just advocating that we should hurt children because they don't do what hurt adults children. tell them uh-huh. to do. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh-huh. and you know I don't. You know, she didn't. She didn't really make any sense. It was just going on about the same old stuff about you know how children are are getting impossibly difficult and how it's going to lead to more violence in the world. And she was just really uninformed. She really didn't know what she was talking about. And then she she started going on about. So so let me see if I'm if I'm hearing if I'm understanding what you're saying that it was it's just hard for you to hear her talk about corporal punishment because it's so different than than what you value and, and maybe what you think is best for children. And it, it was just really hard for you to, to kind of be in that, be listening to her at all. Is that? Yeah. I was just thinking what's wrong with this woman, you know? I mean, she's not like she's an uneducated person either. Yeah. yeah. So you were thinking if she has this education, then why is it, you know, why does she hold these, these kind of values that are so different than what you value. And it sounds like pretty disturbing for you, really, because well, of, yeah, of what mean, you think yeah. is good for children. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, she's talking to a lot of parents, and she's going around talking at schools and to to parents and all sorts of organizations, and she's spreading this idea, you know, and people are already so confused, and a lot of people, you know, really don't know what to do and how, how they're supposed to deal with some of the perceived problems around discipline and she's just spreading the strategy it's just you know it's gonna yeah so you you're concerned about how she's sharing that with other people in the community and the effect on on the sort of larger community so it sounds like is it you're you're really concerned because of yeah, ultimately yeah. really wanting the well-being for children and how people um kind of how those ideas are being shared in the community around what's really going to support children's well-being Exactly, yeah. How about we stop there? So what I was doing, I was tracking that I was doing both understanding, kind of just reflecting back Matthew's words and understanding, and then at the end they're focusing in on his needs and sort of deepening into his needs. And I was trying to listen for, oh, I wonder what what quadrant he's talking from, and I wonder what the other person's quadrant might be, you know, this person he's talking about could be coming from. And but given our time, how about just to give people a chance to break up into pairs again and just pick one of you to talk about a conflict, just some frustration you have with somebody right now, and one of you listen. And as you're listening and reflecting back what you hear, see if you can pay attention to those four elements of empathy and wondering which quadrant the person you're talking to is speaking from and maybe what quadrant the other person might be in as well. Let's do five minutes. So it'll be pretty quick. Just hopefully give you a little taste of putting it all together. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. I'm curious, anybody wants to report your experience with four elements of empathy and the four quadrants of perspectives, four different perspectives? I was free to try to track those things. I assume, John, that you're talking about as the as the listener that I was thinking about the various lenses or quadrants through which she was speaking. Is that right? Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But also, even yeah. if you were even if you were the speaker, were you aware of of anything in terms of how the person was listening to you? But yeah, particularly if you were the the empathizer. Yeah. A lot of where Carol was coming from was quadrant one, how she was feeling in her interaction or lack of interactions. But there was an element of quadrant two in the expectations, cultural expectations, 
and in quadrant three about the kind of actions that she wanted this other person to take and quadrant four in the system that this other person was involved in and how it affected their relationship. So you were tracking actually all four quadrants, how what she was saying could, could fit into each one. Right. It felt sort of awkward to be trying to empathize in this particular way and also listening for the quadrants at the same time. You mean it was just a lot to try to pay attention to? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I can imagine it was a lot. Okay. So maybe just to reflect just a moment longer on my experience of listening to Matthew. As I was listening to Matthew talk, I was kind of zeroing on, you know, what's the sort of primary, you know, so I could, could look at it from different quadrants, but what's the main one? And I was thinking the lower left, the cultural worldview kind of shared meaning. And it was, oh, yeah, it seems like he's really focused on that one. So that was kind of helping me sort of zero in on where's he coming from? Where's his sort of center of gravity in terms of, of that worldview perspective? And then I just imagine the other person maybe was in the lower right, the kind of systems and corporal punishment as a way to kind of maintain order and in the society. And I don't know if that's true or not, but it was just sort of helping me start to map out maybe where that conflict was occurring in, in terms of different worldviews. And when I do pre-mediation work, I, I try to help someone not only connect to their own experience, but wonder about where the other person might be coming from. So it was sort of helping me do that. And I'm wondering, Carol, if, if there was anything about that too, that even though you were finding the different quadrants that your partner could be mapping it to, that there was maybe one that was particularly standing out. The or, upper left, yeah. The upper left, yeah. And did you get any sense of what maybe the other person, were they maybe in a different one? Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you. And I know we're over time, so I want to end there. And I have a request to all of you between now and next time to, to pay attention when you're listening to somebody, those four elements of empathy, which, you know, just sort of tracking and trying to remember those four elements of empathy, and also be listening for the different quadrants and what you're hearing, the quadrants that Matthew offered and, and how you're listening to what what's going on for people. So just as a homework possibility to be looking for those things when you're listening to people in your life. Take care, everyone. Thanks for being on the call. 